Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is René Mardones. I'm here with um, Union United Coalition and also Job for Somerville. I want to welcome our um, uh, candidates uh, running for city councilor at large. Um, let me introduce uh, councilor at large, Will Imba, um, city councilor at large, Mario Rossetti, city councilor at large, um, Bill White. And um, our challenger, um, let me see your name. Can you help me um, with your name here? Uh, Christine Strasso. Strasso. Welcome. My name is Christine Strasso. Um, so let's, uh, we're going to do a similar uh, format than the um, school committee. So we're going to go around with a um, statement. So I will invite uh, Will to introduce yourself. Rene, can I ask a question? Many times I've run public meetings and I've allowed folks to go over two minutes. So the next public meeting we have, you're going to be limited to two minutes. How's okay, that? <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Hello? Okay. So thank you everyone for being here. And it's really a true honor for me to be back here in front of you and also to the organize, organizers of this uh, forum, the different community groups. I want to thank you for putting this event together. So my name is William Bach. I'm running for re-election for city council as a councilor at large. And I still remember, you know, when I immigrated to the United States after winning the diversity lottery visa from Cameroon in 2010. That was a wonderful experience. I can tell you that it was an opportunity of a lifetime. And I also remember, you know, quickly discovering some of it and actually falling in love with this city. Just the people, the generosity of the people in this community the diversity, the fine arts, the music, the progressive politics, the activism made me didn't want to leave from this community after I found out about Somerville. But I must tell you that early on, it wasn't an easy process. As I began to search for an affordable apartment to rent and look for a good paying job, that was quite a a serious challenge for me. And just to put it to scale, I moved five times in six years to look for an affordable apartment. I was even temporarily displaced to a neighboring community. So it is my struggle to live in, to, in this community that drove me to run for office in the first, for my first term in, in office. And it is my determination to fight to keep some of your community for all which includes the artists, the workers, the immigrants in this community to be, to continue to, to preserve them, to make sure that they continue to be in the community for all. And I must also tell you that we've made great success in my first time in office, but there's still a lot of work to be done. I've proven through my first time in office that we'll continue to do what is right to preserve and empower this community by standing up to the forces of displacement that are undermining our community. So I want to ask for your support as I continue to fight greed, speculation, and displacement in this community. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Councilor Mario, please. Thank you, Andre. Um, thank you to uh, our revolution for this evening to have the opportunity to be heard before all of you. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. When I was a little girl, uh, President Kennedy was in office and my parents always had in our den a quote of his, especially after he was assassinated, that's his statement of, ask not what your country could do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I always re reflected on that as I, as I grew in life. And when I made the decision to run for office for school committee back in 1999, it was because of President Kennedy. 
um, an encouragement by the community that I never saw in my life politics ever. Nobody in my family was involved in politics, but I ran, I was elected, I served on the school committee for seven terms, and I stepped back because my children had graduated, and by then, that time, a majority of the school committee had no children in the school district. It bothered me, and I said, time to, give, to lay my hat. And I did, and then I was encouraged to run for office as alderman. Wasn't in my prediction either, but I was lucky to be elected, and I'm completing my third term now, and because the wheels of government turn ever so slowly, I am asking for your support for, the, for another term. Two-year term is short, takes a long time to get something accomplished. I would be grateful if you would consider me in that role. I pride myself on constituent services. I do my best to answer everybody's phone call, email, stop into Moolahs, as Carrie said earlier. Um, and I may not give you the answer you're looking for. I may not end up voting the way you wanted, but it doesn't stop me from returning your call or talking with you about what it is you want to share with me and what I have to learn from you. And I've learned a lot from so many people in this community. As I said in my statement of the um, questionnaire that you asked us to answer, I love my community. I always have. I always will. And I would consider it an honor to continue to be your voice for the next two years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Hi, I'm Bill White. What a great, what a great turnout. Um, it's hard to think that already two years have gone by. And when I first appeared before you folks, one of the things that I said was I grew up during the era of the Vietnam War and civil rights demonstrations and how terrible it has become a generation when they were young that were motivated to protest and to try to promote a good society has created instead one of the societies that has the most unequal distribution of income and where it's so difficult for poor, for poor folks to advance. So who knew what this group would be able to accomplish in the next, the last city election. So it was great for me to be able to participate in it as we moved some of them forward in so many important issues. So maybe in a way it's uh, part for me to make amends for what my generation did. And what I've done should not be a surprise to at least some of the old progressives that I see here who raised the banner and worked hard for many years, sometimes when they were in the, very much in the minority on a lot of the important issues and how that's changed because now they're working with the, a lot of the younger folks who are now getting involved. But if you think about development, back over 20 years ago when Assembly Square was proposed to be a strip mall, my very first meeting, I introduced an ordinance for proposed moratorium and development at Assembly Square until the community could get together and present our own design for the type of mixed-use development that we wanted. It wasn't totally successful. What we got was much better. When it came to the Union Square redevelopment plan, I voted against it, as I've said, because it was bass Ackwards. Instead of picking a developer and then working out deals, we should have decided as a community what we wanted and put it out to bid. So it shouldn't have been a surprise where as chair of the Finance Committee, folks from Union United came to me and said, are you gonna put forward the proposed land transfer agreement that would, have, that would give that parcel of land in Union Square to the developer before a community benefits agreement was negotiated? As chair of finance, and of course I had the support of the entire council on that, no way was it going forward. So in important issues like development, campaign about not taking money from developers, I drafted the most comprehensive campaign finance ordinance perhaps in any municipality. Some folks say it hasn't gone far enough, but we have a Republican Supreme Court to worry about. So all of my other positions, labor, I've walked the picket lines, I did it with Stop and Shop, and I've tried to support labor on a lot of the uh, issues that they've brought. I supported the linkage fee as well, and I think my time has gone up, so I appreciate it. And You'll know I will continue on this path if I'm reelected, and I would appreciate your support. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, my name is Kristen Strezzo, and thank you so much for offering this opportunity to speak with you. I'm really grateful. 
I'm running for city councilor at large because I love our city. I spent my early years in a feminist punk band, writing lyrics, challenging inequity, motivating change through music, and that's what I really loved about it, bringing attention to, to important issues through that. I came to Somerville for grad school. I'm now a mom of two kids, and I chose to care for my 92-year-old grandmother who lives with me. And on a personal note, we're a family who have benefited from inclusionary zoning, accessible housing, and affordable housing. I have a direct experience of that, and I am grateful for that moment. Every single day, I'm grateful for that. It has changed my life for the better, and I have never, ever lost touch of that. I had to step back from my career so that I can care for the needs of my family and my grandmother, but I have never, ever lost touch with my community, and I have found ways to give back to my community, a city that has given me so much. I have volunteered in many ways to connect our city, to serve our city, to really fix up our city. I became the co-chair of the Somerville Commission for Women in Challenging Equity. I testified it in so, uh, Challenging for Equity. I became, I, I testified it twice in support of the 1% transfer fee at the State House because I want all of us to thrive. Our city is a place where you can truly be yourself and I love that about be, uh, living here. I love our city. There's a place for everyone here. But as we're all being priced out, we have this creative community and we're gonna lose it. We're losing our small businesses. Wages have stalled. Housing, buying a house, feels unobtainable. We're gonna lose that diversity. We've lost a lot of it. And it's time to bring those that understand that firsthand to the table. I'm a family that's experiencing that firsthand. I understand. I get it. Quality life issues are also really important, and I'm going to sustain that. And I'm going to work hard for you, because I have been. I'm caring for both spectrums of ages, two young children and the elderly. I understand a lot of what the residents are going through, and I'm committed to better solutions that serve. My goal is to advocate. And I want city councilors with lived experience, and I am grateful for this chance right here and hope for future to be to be to serve as your city councilor so we can all thrive i'm here to serve i'm here to fight alongside you and i'm here to guide somerville into the next decades of growth responsibly i would love for your support and thank you so very much for this chance thank you thank you can you hear me yeah i'm Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so um, before uh, we go to um, the question, um, remember uh, we have some uh, yellow car and red car that is gonna be your uh, time limit. Um, I'm gonna, uh, after my first question, I'm gonna alternate questions, or uh, alternate who is gonna answer those questions. So um, let's begin. Um, Probably you remember that in 2015, uh, the city and the community created the Sustainable Working Group Recommendation Report that has been, you know, like a roadmap for most of the policy around affordable housing. Um, last year, the city and the community created the Somerville Talent Equity Book. Um, if you don't, haven't seen it, we have copies in the Job for Somerville Union United table. You can take one. Uh, my question is, aside of this recommendation, what are you um, ideas about how we can create more permanent job for Somerville residents? Let's start with Councilor Umba. Thank, thank you, Rene, for that question. I think this is uh, we need first to advocate, you know, for good paying jobs. One, the jobs with predictable schedule you know, with benefits. And when I talk about good paying job, I mean jobs with a living wage. And also I'm grateful for the chair of finance who actually, we recently enacted a $15 living wage for the city. 
But I also think that we need to also start thinking outside of the box because we need to start having using our power in zoning to be able to create more sustainable jobs. Like this, all this business cooperative where workers actually own part of the business. I think if I remember correctly, Cambridge Cambridge Natural, like owned by one of the activists in the community, has that kind of dynamic where part the workers actually own part of have a share in the business. So those are those are like one of the things that we should be considering. You know, having a system. I think it's kind of like a solidarity economy where you can you have your workers, you know, fully vested in your in in the job that they are doing. That's one fundamental way that we can use our power in zoning to be able to like give tax breaks to some of those businesses that are trying to, you know, uh, encourage such a sustainable job that lasts long in the community and empower citizens. Thank you, Councillor Mba. Councillor Rossetti. Thank you for the question, Renee. Um, in meeting with some constituents on, on my summer break that we have now, I was reminded by a very knowledgeable citizen here that Somerville, we have a large majority of 20 and 30 year olds here in Somerville, which actually doubles the national average. And to make that sustainable for them to stay here and age and age here, we have to do a better job at creating jobs for the community so that you can live, work, play, raise a family within your own community. About 30 months ago, um, my colleague, Councillor White and um, Ballantyne spearheaded um, getting us to raise the MMUR of districts within our community for 68% of co commercial development. And nothing has been built since that vote. We are trying our best to create jobs within the community so that you can remain and stay and age in place here. And it's my opinion that we need to build better commercial development and do so in the districts that there are some areas that are, will be building up soon, and, and it's the hope that that will be the saving grace for the commercial development and lab space and job opportunities, local jobs. And right now, I am working on a wage theft or, or, uh, ordinance and license and permits with all my colleagues as we address this and the importance of it. There are a lot of ways to go about it, and I think I missed my red card, so I will stop there. My Thank apologies. You. <laughs> Consider what? One of the things is to learn from what happened at Union Square and instead have the conditions put on ahead of time, right? To think about what type of jobs, what type of businesses do we want to have created. So when it comes to city property, at the first level, that can easily be done. The second way to do it is through zoning, further refined zoning. Because see, one of the things that I get concerned with is we're talking about let's bring high tech, for instance, to solve it. Okay, but how about folks who need working class jobs, right? One of the ways to do it is like through hotels, for instance. Hotels employ an awful lot of people, and hotels would also help with business development. So we have to have an equal eye when we look at development in the city to make sure you know, all groups, income groups, prosper and, and benefit from it. We also have to think, again, we see with Union Square empowering neighborhood groups to work out community benefit agreements, because who better knows like what's going on in their neighborhoods than the folks who live there and what should go forward. So I really think we have to look at it with different eyes now, because you know, people are talking about we have to think about what brings in the most taxes. But that's not necessarily it. You have to, again, look at the balance with taxes and jobs. And we have to keep looking at our jobs linkage fee to see the production from that. And that, as development goes forward with a lot of these um, businesses coming in, it may be time to look at that to increase it as well. I'd like to see a concentrated mentoring program at the city to work with folks from the community who are entering the job market to tie them in to you know, folks that are offering I'm training based on the linkage fee, but also with developers when they come in, 
have the commitment not only to hire local summer visitors, but how about young kids who are entering the job market? Get that commitment as well. So those folks especially will get a good heads up start in the community and they'll be able to stay here. Thank you, Councillor White. Uh, Christine, please. Kristen. Kristen. Um, I, I am the, of the generation that is experiencing the fact that we can't just start a small business as easily anymore. My focus, I would like to, I worry about our small businesses here in Somerville and rents skyrocket. They can't uh, stay. I, we have to move. I think we have to find better solutions so that we can sustain our small businesses. We lose ourselves as a city if we, if the more smaller businesses we lose through that. Um, I was talking to a hairdresser today that wants to start a business in Somerville and with a rent for 800 square feet at $3,000, that's not possible. She's been in Somerville her whole life. And personally, I don't want to live in a world without Lindell's Donuts. I don't. And I've knocked over a thousand doors at this point. And people, we love our community. We've got to find every single way possible that we can, that we have more solutions for that. I'm committed to that. Thank you. So let's go to our, our second question. Um, in your questionnaire responses, you all indicated that you will bring a tenant right to purchase home rule petition to a vote before the end of the next term. However, some of your questionnaire responses indicated openness to exemptions to that tenant right to purchase. For example, including properties under a certain number of units. Can you commit tonight not to support any except exemption to a tenant right to purchase, or if you do support some exemptions, please explain what those exemptions will be and why you will support them. How will you deal with the pressure from the real estate groups like the Small Property Owner Association and the Somerville Chamber of Commerce and the newly created Somerville Small Property Coalition? Um, let's begin with uh, Councillor Mary Orsetti. Thank you. Appreciate the question. Um, I, it was I who responded that I would definitely support it. And I put in my answer for greater than three unit properties. It's now under discussion in the Legislative Matters Committee. And I don't know if, Renee, if you're aware that it's had multiple draft changes. And the draft that sits before the committee now, to my understanding, includes that language. I must admit, I have not had the opportunity to read it, the latest draft, because I've been inundated with other priorities from committees that I serve on. And the council that sits in, uh, currently in office, we listen closely to our committee reports. I actually print them out and read them before the meeting, so especially if I wasn't able to attend a meeting. Um, so I anxiously await further discussion in that committee. There are five of my colleagues who are serving currently on that committee, and they've done tremendous work for the rest of us to bring items out of committee for our vote. Oftentimes with um, important votes such as this, the chairs will hold a meeting of the whole, and we have multiple meetings of the whole. So I will uh, weigh in then. But because it's in draft form, and I want to respect my five colleagues who are working on that draft, and they've changed the first draft of the administration multiple times, and they continue um, to change it. And I know that the chair had stated that it was his intent to bring that forward. Um, so I think. If I remember reading everybody's answers, we all voted yes because we do consider that as one of the priorities in our upcoming months. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, the, concern, the concern I have is with regard to family transfers because I do estate planning and, and practice. And a lot of the old timers in Somerville have a house and they may have three or four children. And sometimes to work out a deal with the children, say a couple of children have a house on their own, um, and one of the children has been at home, they will strike a deal with the child, for instance, who purchased the house for less than a fair market value. 
So in a case like that, where it's, I mean, it's a small problem, not if it was a, you know, like a 10 family house or something like that, but we're dealing with two and three family homes where again, one of the tenants may be the kid who stayed there and taken care of the parents and they're gonna give them a deal. I think I would want an exemption like that. Now you wanna make sure that there's no gimmicks going on like they sell it to the kid and then two months later he sells it to somebody else to work around the ordinance. But I believe if there's a good faith reason to, to, you know, to give it to a, a child especially, then I would really consider an exemption like that. Great, thank you. Kristen? Uh, I don't think that there should be exemptions. And I support Ken's right. And I am a tenant, so I understand directly what this is like. And I think that this is one way that we can sustain our families and make sure that different backgrounds and classes and maintain our diversity of the city. This is one way we can do it. I support it. Great, thank you. Councilor Mba? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I think it is, it is uh, important to note that most of our current laws right now, you know, look out for landlords. And so, uh, and we, you know, as tenants, you know, we deserve, you know, to also, you know, live a dignified life, you know, we need to be protected as well. So, um, in terms of exemptions, I want to be more careful because I also don't want something that will not have any teeth. I, so it, uh, it's a trick, it's, it's a slippery slope, but I am open, you know, to exemptions considering maybe like one or two, you know, like family homes, because when, when, when I think about three family homes, it seems that like the whole sum of it is three family homes, so everybody will be exempted. So I would think I will consider that carefully. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Mba. Um, let me go to the third question. So um, for what has been um, publicly announced, um, the Union Square Neighbor Council is getting very close to an agreement um, with the master developer of Union Square on uh, CBA. And um, some of you have said that you all support a community benefit you know, like agreement when these big um, uh, projects come to our city. So um, how we can be sure um, that you will fight for the best deal possible, uh, especially with the uh, construction of the Green Line extension? Um, what are the point of leverage um, that you will be willing to use um, to get the best deal possible for our city? Um, uh, let's start with uh, Councillor uh, White. Okay, so if you look at all of what they call the transitional development areas, you're gonna need new zoning. So the question is, you have leverage. So one of the faults, perhaps, in the, in the past um, was that we didn't exercise leverage to the greatest extent possible. I don't think we did it at assembly, for instance. Um, so when you do the zoning, you would put in first the conditions that you want where it's gonna affect neighborhoods especially, then you would have a, a provision in there um, to the extent you could legally do it to have a negotiation of a community benefits agreement. Further, as, you know, as we're going over the zoning ordinance, we have to think about to the maximum extent possible we can condition special permits on the types of things um, that we want as well. So a combination of those factors and as well as, as the bully pulpit, um, where votes may be necessary in conjunction with the development, like we did it at Union Square. I remember back first making the commitment that we wouldn't pass the zoning until it was the pledge to do the, you know, the development agreement. And by the then Board of Aldermen holding firm, it got to the table. And then when there was the transfer of land that was necessary, we had the further leverage to require that there be an actually negotiated community development agreement. So that was exercising our leverage, and that should serve as an example going forward as we hit, it, as we go into these transitional areas um, to make sure that you get the maximum community benefits. And again, just to follow up with the jobs, that's what I spoke about earlier. The zoning is an opportunity to do that. And this current zoning that we have really doesn't address these transitional areas where development is proposed to go forward. They're gonna have their own zoning. So that's when it's gonna be very important to take a hard look at it to ensure that that zoning 
promotes community development like we want it. Thank you, Councillor White. Kristen? I agree. I, well, I think that uh, an important factor is setting the precedence with, with corporations that come in, developers that come in. Uh, a lot of times it seems like we are also a testing ground for what they can get away with and how, how far they can push to get what they want and keeping maintaining the community and the community groups and community groups involved in that is, is step one in that. And and always number one remembering that we're if, if we don't if we don't raise our voices and stand up, we are setting the precedence for the next corporation and the next set of developers to do this again and again and again. Thank you. Councillor Mba. Thank you. Uh, so I want to just optimize on the, the sentiment of my colleague, uh, Bill White. I think um, Union Square was wrong on many levels. And I'm really proud and glad to have recognized and supported the creation of the, of the Union Square Neighborhood Council to be negotiating a community benefit agreement you know, with uh, the master developer US to Union Square. So going forward, you know, we need to have an inclusive community process up front, not the other way around. So always having you know, like a community group that is always being consulted, negoti negotiating. In the beginning, we will have a robust community benefit agreement. So that is uh, all I can say, and that is the pathway forward that uh, the neighborhood council is it's, it's a main, it's a main touch now to be able to like educate us on how to navigate on all the different platforms that development will be coming forward along the Green Line corridors. Great. Thank you, Councilor. Renee, I want to make sure I understood your question. Are you talking to, specifically to future developments? Or are you talking to what's happening in Union Square today? I think uh, uh, future development. Future, okay. Yeah, because so, Union Square is almost done. Right. <laughs> well, internal I'll, negotiating. I'm waiting. I continue the CDA, to wait. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I continue to wait. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, similar to my colleagues, the the zoning and and we can condition. We can place conditions on certain purposes of lands and seals, but first and foremost, as um, Bill said, you know, some things were done bass backwards, mm -hmm. and we learned from that um, when. When the CBA discussion was coming about, and brand new discussion for Somerville, I happened to be chairing legislative matters at the time. And I received invitation to go to a community gathering where a gentleman was brought up from New Jersey who educated the room. And I learned a lot from him that evening about the, how community um, CBAs were developed in New York. I think it was Philadelphia. I have my notes at home. But I, um, I learned a lot that evening. And then as we moved forward in Somerville, with the group of citizens who really wanted to go in that direction for Union Square, as chair of legislative matters, I worked and maybe slightly slowed up the process for the vote that was needed by the council until we were sure that we all understood clearly that we had the right language for the ordinance as related to community benefits agreements. And um, we're all watching what's happening in Union Square right now. That's no secret. A lot of people are watching it, and I'm hoping that other squares and neighborhoods are learning about what they can do because their developments, as we all know, are going to be happening citywide in the future. And I am going to do what I can to support neighborhoods to create their own neighborhood councils to work on CBAs because it's been proven it can be done and it should be done and I'm proud to have been a part of it the little pe little bit that I had to be a part of it I'm very happy and proud that I voted the way I did then thank you councillor Rossetti um, so our next question um, if Somerville is to achieve his goal of carbon neutrality by 2050 and mitigate climate change it will need to begin transformative action that might even go beyond the Somerville Climate Forward Plan right now. What specific action will you prioritize and how will you accelerate their implementation? Um, Kristen, 
you would you like to begin? It's a really good question, and I think we need to be talking about climate change pretty much every day, mm. bringing it up as much as we can. Uh, carbon neutrality is important. Number one, divest if we not, and I think that that is number one. Make sure that we're divesting from uh, immediately. Second, I would. I would like to work uh, and, and the city to contract and partner more with uh, companies and corporations that are, uh, are more green, are more on that vision. Because I have a five-year-old. And what I've learned with my five-year-old is that positive reinforcement works. We can set the precedence for, uh, for positivity. And, and the more green we're choosing, the more we're, we're choosing more green companies and working with that more and more and more and more and, and ignoring the bad behavior of the companies where it, which has been standard for decades and centuries. We can, we can guide that vision faster because if we set the bar, believe me, they're going to jump. And I think we should start there. Thank you. Um, Councilor Mba? Thank you, Rene. Uh, this is a, it's a great question. And when I think about it, first thing that comes to my mind, first of all, is about environmental justice. And I also think about equity on that front to prioritize issues that proportionally affect people of color and working class. And what I'm thinking about is people along I-93, you know, in Ward 1, my good friend, and Councillor McLaughlin, providing sound barriers to mitigate the pollution that is happening right there. And also, also thinking about, you know, like prioritizing retrofitting, like senior homes, shelters, and hospitals. Those are the, you know, people that are also less thought of. And also incentivize green roofs, because we know that green roofs provide, you know, open space, sequester carbon dioxide, and improve air quality. So there's a lot, I can go on and on and on, but in the interest of time, there's a lot we can do on that front. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Omar. Councillor Rossetti. Thank you. Uh, one thing I learned recently is uh, the development of passive housing. And uh, I went to a meeting that Ben Ewan Camden had in his community of a developer who wanted to build such, and I honestly didn't know what it meant, what it was. And I attended the meeting and I learned a lot and unfortunately, as the project moved forward, the developer thought they pulled back, it wasn't possible, and Ben has since informed me that they are back again, it's gonna be happening. When I left that meeting, I spoke with Dan Bartman, who's working on the revised zoning overhaul, and I asked him, is there encouragement and incentivization for passive housing build up here in Somerville? And he assured me there was. So we are waiting for the updated version of the zoning overhaul that I think will be coming before us very soon and I'm gonna look at that section. Uh, as far as green roofs and, um, I'm on the high school building committee and when we voted that project, um, I worked aggressively with the student rep who I fought for to get voting rights by the way and I'm glad I did because he advocated very much in favor of areas of concern for him and worried. Yeah, he was graduating in a few years. He knew it wouldn't benefit him, but he wanted it to benefit families and students of the future and the environment. And he and I both lost on our vote, but we, st we, st we, stand we stood true to how we felt. So I continue to work on this project with the project manager, and we've had to make some cuts recently, and um, we're gonna make sure they're not cutting. We're gonna make use of stormwater. We're going to, uh, we, they, to keep me happy, they've created a classroom on a roof, which I was told couldn't be done because the insurance would be too high. Well, it's happening. Um, so I continue to learn and try to understand better so that when I am advocating in a meeting, I feel as though I know what I'm talking about and I can give some backbone to it. But honestly, I learned from a lot of people in this community. We live in a community that has a lot of very smart people in it. And I'm just so proud and grateful to have met and made friends with all of you. Thank you, Councilor Orsetti. Councilor White. I want to follow up on what Councilor Orsetti said about a lot of smart people. I remember, and again, I'm dating myself, but this was before climate change was a word or a problem that everybody knew about. This was a group of Somerville um, 
professors and folks who were expert in climate back, I, I'm thinking it was like in the late 90s where they said, let's have a climate action commission for the city of Somerville. And you know, I supported that. And you know, working with them early on, they brought a tremendous amount of knowledge about the impact uh, that's, that's going forward. So I guess the first response would be to lead by example. Let's think of to the extent we can maximize purchasing electric vehicles. That would be the first thing. Um, the second thing would be to the extent that we have like preferences given, say, to Zipcar or anything like that, that they incorporate electric vehicles. Um, I know with regard to the, the cab company here, they've asked for a waiver of the medallion fees. Um, what the city has basically come back with and say, well, we'll waive it if you have electric vehicles. When we build our own buildings, we should try to get it to the highest lead level possible. Um, and one of the most interesting things is uh, a person came to me, and there's actually a way to use geoth geothermal science. Um, they dig into the ground, and depending on the temperatures of the ground, they're actually able to utilize it to either heat and cool, so you don't have the extensive like HVA systems that, that a lot of buildings have that use a lot of carbon-based fuels. And that would be something really to investigate, and especially if you could incorporate that in the zoning requirements going forward in, in, in our transitional districts. That, I think, would be a push. One of the concerns has been, though, that if you need electric power to utilize this geothermal heating and cooling, and the electricity that's currently being used may be more than you, than you would, you know, it utilizes more carbon than other alternatives, so that would make sense. But I, as we go forward, I think it's definitely something to explore. Thank you, Councillor White. Um, so here is our uh, fifth question that is include like three questions in that one. So um, stay with me. Um, do you want to update our current inclusionary zoning rules? And will you increase the affordable housing percentage? And will you change the exep exemptions for small development? So let's begin with uh, Councillor uh, Mba. Thank you, Renee, for that question. Uh, one, I will consider increasing the inclusionary zoning to 25% uh, because I think fundamentally we need more housing. And I had a conversation with uh, the good councillor from Ward 5. Uh, he was also like in support of that, even why I was still campaigning for office. Um, in terms of exemption i don't think there should be there should be any i think if you're if you're like if if you're rich enough to build even if even if it's a one apartment you should be able to at least make some form of contribution towards an affordable housing trust fund to build more housing in this community period thank you councillor mba <laughs> councillor rosetti renee so in in I'm anxiously awaiting report from the administration as I, my colleagues vote. When, since we voted the 20% inclusionary zoning, the smaller development zero has happened. So I'm wondering, do we need to incentivize the development to make use of the 20% so that it will be beginning in the smaller developments? Why aren't they developing? What can we do to make it happen? And I really want to discuss that with the full board. Um, waiting for the administration. We did ask the administration for a report, and I believe it's coming to us soon, of the data of what's been happening, but nothing on the lower level. Um, but recently, again, with a very smart individual of our community, I learned, and I wanted to bring this forward in an order for our next meeting in um, August, and I have to read my notes because I'm just Please. researching it myself. But there's uh, the most recent Supreme Court case um, brought by uh, community California and Nevada combined, the Supreme Court sided with the planning authority as a related to tempor a temporary moratorium on building of unaffordable housing in certain districts. So I really am intrigued by this. I started to pull it up and research it. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an expert. I intend to ask the administration to look into this, share it with my colleagues so they can be educated as was I recently by a constituent. Um, 
if I understood this community correctly, like what we could do in Somerville is on the TOD districts, transit oriented mm -hmm. districts, with the build, build up that would be happening, make it to be all affordable mm -hmm. while we're changing our zoning, while we're doing this build up of our community, while we're trying to attain the goals mm -hmm. that, you know, all of the Commonwealth is trying to, to get at with the housing. We need more housing, but how can we do it and how can we make it affordable? We talked earlier about job security and I have a red screen, so bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Rossetti. Councilor White? Thank you. Councilor Rossetti, if you could email me that case, having done my own moratorium, usually you can only do that for study purposes, so for it's a limited period of time to enact a study, but you know, it, it could make sense. I've always voted for increases in the affordable housing rates and the linkage fees, but I have to be honest, you need to do a linkage study under state law. You have to have some sort of a study that's done to show the rationale behind it. So we're in the process of doing that, looking um, at what the results were of the 20%. And I know Councilor Rossetti mentioned that it, it appears that perhaps nothing was done. See, the, the problem was, from what I understand, is larger units were done. So instead of saying doing a six unit building, because they would have to do you know, the, the linkage, they make four really luxury apartments. Um, and so it, it, it defeats the purpose. So the last thing you want to do is defeat the purpose um, you know, and you can try linkage fees. We're trying enough of them with the state legislature, but we have to be concerned. They may not approve any of our linkage fees. Um, what we have to do, I, I believe, is think about what we can do as a city without any more home rule petitions. Because you can't put your eggs in a basket where the state may just turn it over and nothing will hatch. So one of the things we have is land in the city of Somerville. and. The cost of land is a tremendous expense for developers. So what we could do is utilize that land with developers who want to be big buildings, OK? There are HUD programs that are available. So I think what we should look at HUD funding programs for developers. There are some developers out there who will, expect, who will accept a lower rate of return than other developers. So we should really think on our own how we can have affordable, large affordable housing developments of 500 units or more by incorporating city land. That's a way it's under our own control. Thank you, Councilor White. Christy? My frustration is the detachment of these goals. 2040, 2020, that's super, but we have families being displaced this week. We have families on this, on the, in, the, in the playground that are having to make the hard decision tomorrow. And my approach would be finding out more home ownership opportunities. First, I'd say 30%. Like find ways. And I want to see more, more low, lower income home ownership opportunities. Because we want to talk diversity and we want to talk about that inclusion, that's how we, we sustain our families and our community. We can find ways. And that is my, my goal for stabilizing our families. Thank you. I'm pretty sure I have time for one question from the audience. Um, so here we go. So a large, um, a large part of the job of the council under or shorter is to push back against the mayor. What do you think was the worst decision made by the mayor this term, and how do you push back? <laughs> <laughs> so let's begin with um, Councillor uh, White. Hey, no, no, it's <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Mas. This last year, I, I, it would be hard place for me actually to say, because okay, it seems like the election may have sent a message two years ago. Um, but I have to say, on my years on, on the board, and then now calling me a council, thanks to the home uh, petition that I sponsored to change the name from Board of Aldermen to City Council, I, th I think it was Union Square. That was the one, and the pushback, I guess I voted against it not only the redevelopment plan, but also when there was the bonding proposed to take the property by eminent domain for that, I voted against the bonding as well. I was the only one to vote against that. So 
In my experience, that was it, and that's what I did. Thank you, Councillor White. Chris, would you like to answer this question or? The reserve list. Uh, I think that the reserve list um, doesn't allow a lot of people that should have a chance, including women, people of color, and veterans. I think that needs to change. Thank you. Um, I'll do it. I go sure. I think, um, I, I Consular think I Rossetti. <laughs> um, I just think there's a lot that we do a lot of push and pull with the administration. That's why our meetings go on till midnight five days a week. But um, <laughs> for me, I learned a lot with the process of the exemption that Frit got in, a, in Assembly Square. Um, I really felt that given eight aldermen at the time and the many, many members of the community who testified, um, the, the recommendation was still to allow them to have that exemption. And um, I think I referenced that in the way I answered one of the questions on this questionnaire that you know, it, it numbed me for a very long time and it sits with me at a lot of meetings when I'm trying to digest discussion when we have it. And I just, could, I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to let that one go. Thank you. Consular. Yeah, um, I think to me, I, I, I was frustrated when there was no contract with the union workers, the nurses, and that was something that was very frustrated to me. And uh, hope, and then now I'm happy that you know it's been fixed. So that was like one of the worst thing that I mean I don't know if I should say it's the worst decision. I don't know if it was a decision that he made, but what was going on. But this is something that we all, as a council, push hard on him until it was resolved. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kimba. Um, thank you very much uh, for being here. I want to give a round of applause to the candidates. And I'm going to leave you with John. Thank you. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll hang on to this. I'll ask, I got other questions now. I can ask the rest of you guys. Uh, all right. That was really great. Thank you so much. Uh, to the city councilors and the uh, challenger for city council at large, Kristen Strezzo. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I think we've got a couple of uh, closing uh, remarks, a couple of things to discuss. Uh, I want to also thank Tina Cabral and Dave Ortega, who have been behind the camera this evening. Uh, you guys have been great as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and one other thing I want to go over just, just quickly, uh, in the next day or two, um, our Revolution Somerville members will be receiving by email ballots to vote to endorse. Um, and you'll be, you're, you're free to uh, vote to endorse in uh, any race, not just the wards, the ward that you live in. So for example, uh, I live in Ward 1, but I probably will, I will definitely be casting a vote in favor of endorsing JT Scott, who is City Council Ward 2. I can say that now because the, uh, we've, we've had the forum event, so I can tell you I'm going to endorse him. Um, so I'll, I'll be casting that vote. And if you would like to, um, you may endorse in a, in, in uh, any ward, regardless of which ward you live in. Um, so look, check your email for those. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, at the latest, it'll be the day after. Um, and then I've just got one other announcement from Rand Wilson about our membership committee. So I'll bring Rand up here now. Oh, I meant to get you a chair. It's OK. Hey, everybody, I know you want to leave. But our revolution only works because we have members. And if you're not a member of our revolution, we're urging you to join, pay dues, and vote and participate in the endorsement process. We have a membership committee. Couldn't be here tonight, but we need people to be on the membership committee to recruit people to join our revolution Somerville. It only works because you do. So our email address is ourrevolutionsomerville at gmail.com. That's our Revolution Somerville at gmail.com. 
Thank you very much. Have a great night.